Since the beginning of the Advent movement, the strength of God's end time people has been a love of the scriptures. We're determined to let God speak to us in his word. We're determined, unlike some others, that God has sought to bless, but which in due course abandon his word for the commandments of men, we are determined that by his strength, we will be faithful. We want a Bible faith. We want a faith that is true to all that God has revealed. We want to follow Jesus fully. We know that even subtle deviations from Bible truth can wreak havoc on what we think is and is not possible in Jesus' gospel. The lies which sear us the most are those which misrepresent Jesus and which misrepresent his high priestly plans to bring us through as Romans 8.37, our scripture reading you just heard, as more than conquerors. So today we're going to closely study the Bible, but first please grant me a little bit of space to shine a light out, out onto some subtle error. Something that at first glance might sound right. But let us ask ourselves, uh, what is it that makes something sound right? Erroneous teachings and ideas are almost always composed of a truth part and an error part. We have, we have itching ears, uh, part of us, and we, we tend to want to hear things that, that confirm the kind of things that, that we, our, our wrong part wants to hear. But there's usually a truth part and an error part, and it, it is, if we're alert with our conscience and our rational mind, it's going to make it difficult for naked error to get a grip. But if we're not alert, we will often uh, fall into the wrong thing. So remember, it's always the truth that gets appropriated and gets mixed into the error that causes us to uncritically embrace something that, you know, sort of sounds like it's biblical, but in the end we find that it's not. Truth is put on the surface as a glossy covering, but it's the entire blob that we need to consider, not just the shiny parts that sound right. A very recent article appeared in one of our church publications. It's published under the name of our church, and it claims, like the Catholic Church does, that sin is a state into which humans are born. The article claims that, you know, without exception, we all are sinners. But friends, I want you to realize that if we are born into a state of sin, then we are born into a state of condemnation and guilt. This is the classic unbiblical doctrine of original sin. Now, it's true that we are born skewed. We are born disarranged. We are born with a tendency towards sin. But it is false to state that we are born into a state of actual sin. Am I saying that we don't all become sinners? No, we all do become sinners, and we need salvation through Jesus. There's no other way. But are we born into a state of sin? Because a high-profile group of writers in our denomination and theologians have for years been working to inculcate this error concerning sin into our thinking as a people, I, uh, I usually keep this nearby. This is my handy-dandy Catholic catechism. And I want to share with you three or four excerpts from this catechism of Roman Catholic teaching. We're going to study the Bible strongly, but, but first we have to sort of lay this out here. So let me give you three, or uh, I think I have four of these real quick here. This is from, uh, from this book. He, which is talking about Adam, he has transmitted to us, they teach, a sin with which we are all born afflicted. A sin which the death is the death of the soul because of this certainty of faith, which is they're the saying, the claim that humans are born condemned, the church baptizes for the remission of sins even tiny infants who have not committed personal sin. And here's a little picture. You can probably tell what year this is from. And uh, to be fair to them, they said, well, we did, we did this as a joke, but this is a uh, Catholic priest baptizing an infant with sprinkling with a squirt gun during the COVID thing. Yeah, they baptize infants. Here's another one. Baptism by imparting the life of Christ's grace, what does it do? They teach that it erases original sin. Here's another one. 
Mary benefited, first of all, and uniquely from Christ's victory over sin. She was preserved from all stain of original sin and by a special grace of God committed no sin of any kind during her whole earthly life. I'd like to have that experience, wouldn't you? Uh, one more. Now, this one's about Jesus. Like ours, his, talking about Jesus, his human nature is destined for eternal life, but unlike ours, the nature of Jesus, it is perfectly exempt from sin, the cause of death. Interesting bits, interesting bits. Teachings, which may be sound true, but friends, those are Catholic teachings, and in that light, I would like you to consider this end note to this article uh, that we had here, that just came out, and here is the quotation. Only Jesus was born as the Holy One, Luke 135. All humans are born hostile to God, Romans 8, 7, and dead in their sin, Psalm 51, 5, and Ephesians 2, 1 to 3. So all humans in due course sin against God and come into need of salvation. I'm sure we're agreed on that. But is it true that all humans are born hostile to God, that all humans are born dead in sin? Is that a true thought, thought? Now, such things like this have been published off and on in our church since the 1950s. Not in the beginning, but in more recent years. For example, I'd like to consider these statements in a notorious book that was printed in the year 1957. Whatever Jesus took was not his intrinsically or innately. His taking the burden of our inherited weakness and failings, even after 4,000 years of accumulated infirmities and degeneracy, did not in the slightest degree taint his human nature. All that Jesus took, all that he bore, whether the burden and penalty of our iniquities or the diseases and frailties of our human nature, all was taken and borne vicariously. That's a pretty amazing statement. Now just this idea that Jesus bore our sins and even our frailties only vicariously. This was a new line of thought for a people whose purpose was to go by the Bible. Because we are trying to go by the Bible. These big theological ideas here and there, we can look at those. But I want to go by the Bible at the end of the day, don't you? Now, just to make sure we're still on the same page, consider the Cambridge Dictionary definition of vicarious. Here it is. Vicarious means experienced as a result of watching, listening to, or reading about the activities of other people rather than by doing the activities yourself. So notice that vicarious does mean an experience, just not a like experience. So, for example, if you tell me that your close family member died, and I never knew that person. I will experience sorrow for you and with you, but my sorrow will not be in kind as your sorrow for, because you were close to that person in a way that I was not. So yes, there's an experience, but it's not a like experience. I do think, uh, I believe this, from a book from Ellen White, Selected Messages, Ply 1, page 247, Christ did not make believe take human nature, he did verily take it. That I believe. Now, I'm thankful that Jesus himself never once sinned. I'm thankful that he took my sins upon himself, but his death for my sins on the cross was not vicarious. It was actual. He did not pretend to die, but he died for me. And if he did not take my frailties actually, then how is he a savior who is able to, Hebrews 4.15, able to sympathize, able to sympathize with our weaknesses? If that was only sort of like a, a, a role that he played. We're at risk of being robbed of Jesus because some have tangled themselves up and theological views not supported by Scripture. To reduce Jesus to merely a vicarious Savior is to rob us of Jesus of Nazareth. And I'm not one who wants to be robbed. You know, the police in a, in a large city here recently said, look, the thieves, they just want your car, they want to steal your car. So if you come into your house, put your car keys by the front door, they're not trying to harm you, just put them there so that they can just take them and take your car and you won't be hurt. 
Now I'd say set your keys by your by your uh, by your handgun. And uh, but anyway, some of our own people are trying to keep Jesus free from sin. As Catholics do the same in saying that Jesus' humanity was exempt. Or some are saying that, you know, Jesus only experienced this vicariously. But what if Jesus came closer than these want to admit? Now, let me add one more question into this soup, and then we'll go into some Bible answers. If humans are born into a state of sin, follow me here, and thus condemned because of what we are, rather than because of decisions that we have made to rebel, then what happens to us when probation closes? If our nature remains condemned one minute before probation closes, does it not continue in condemnation one minute after probation closes? And then where does that leave us? Now you see, Seventh-day Adventists take the Bible seriously, and so we echo the teaching of Scripture. I know a lot of people, when they get to the book of Revelation, they say, I, I, I'm checking out, I can't understand this, we'll just let the theologians handle it, and, and they miss some of these important bits. For example, this bit in Revelation, if you want to turn to it, Revelation 22. It's like the last page in your Bible, Revelation 22, 11. Now, I'm going to read it to you from the New American Standard Bible. Uh, this is Revelation 22, verse 11. Let the one who does wrong still do wrong, and the one who is filthy still be filthy, and let the one who is righteous still practice righteousness, and the one who is holy still keep himself holy. And you see that in verse 12, right following that, what happens? Literal second coming of Jesus. So this is before Jesus comes, and maybe you're more familiar with the King James language. Let's put that on the screen. He that is unjust, this is 2211. He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. He which is filthy, let him be filthy still. And he that is righteous, let him be righteous still. He that is holy, let him be holy still. See, we believe this. This is part of the Bible. This is a teaching of the Bible. Now, in case you want some evidence for this besides Revelation, because, oh, maybe we're just misinterpreting Revelation, Genesis has some interesting bits for us here. Um, you don't have to turn to it. It's Genesis 7. But let me remind you of this. You can double-check me if you want. It's immediately following this declaration I said that Jesus returns, 22, 12. Now, remember this. Just as God sealed Noah into the ark before the end, that's Genesis 7, 16, if you want to look it up. Noah goes into the ark, and it doesn't say that Noah pulled the door shut. It says that God sealed him in. Just as God sealed Noah in the ark before the end, and remember, Noah and the animals, they remained inside for a full seven days before there was one drop of rain, Right? And God then judged the earth by water. That's Genesis 7, verse 4 and 10. In like manner, friends, in the end, human probation closes just before Jesus judges the earth by fire. And there is a period of time in which we must live in God's sight, kept by him, cooperating with him, and not sinning. Just like Noah was sealed by God, and then he had to wait we, in the end of time, will be sealed by God, and we're going to talk about that in our prophecy meetings next two, week, two weeks from now. Uh, but we have, and then Jesus comes. So there's a biblical parallel to this. But anyway, we spent some time here on some of the problems. I want to move more into the direction of answers, because we want to hear the word of God here. And sometimes we have to put some air out in the front so that we can actually see what we're responding to. But let's move into some biblical kinds of answers. I want to move into the corrective part of our message. Now we said man is born damaged. He is born impacted by a sin for which he's not personally responsible. But man is not born into sin as a state. Man is not born into a state of condemnation. Man is born into what? We could say a situation in which his faculties are disordered and distorted. He is born with weaknesses and tendencies to evil but he's not condemned for those tendencies until he joins himself to them. This is a very important point. It seems like maybe like a small point. But let me illustrate it with something that used to, it was very, a very big thing. It still happens in the world, but um, especially at the end of the 1700s and the beginning of the 1800s, there was a very popular practice in some of our large cities. It was pickpocketing. There were whole families that flourished in those times that they trained their children into pickpocketing. 
And pickpocketing usually involves multiple people. One will bump into you and another will, at the moment you're bumped into, that's when they grab your stuff, right? And there's quite an art to it. In fact, there's several articles on the internet lamenting that the art of pickpocketing is going away. Well, I don't lament it. But uh, because people don't carry much cash anymore, and they say that there's less pickpocketing, so maybe that's a, a good thing that's happening. But I want you to notice here on the pickpocketing, until an individual, let's say you're a child and you're born into a family of pickpockets. Mom's a great trainer of pickpockets. Dad's a great trainer of pickpockets. Your older brother's a big trainer, good, he could really train you how to do it. You're, and then here you go, I'm a little baby into the world, and you're, you're born into this family of pickpockets. Are you guilty of pickpocketing? No. When do you become guilty of pickpocketing? When you actually do the thing. Now you're guilty of pickpocketing. But now how, if a kid is born into a family of pickpockets, what's, and they're training him how to do it, what's the likelihood that he's not going to be a pickpocket? It's pretty, a pretty severe situation. He's very, 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 very likely to become a pickpocket. But he's not guilty of pickpocketing yet until he does it. So friends, this is kind of like the human situation. The Bible nowhere uses the language. And you can look in your concordances and so on. You won't find this. Unless you have like a paraphrase Bible, you might find one somewhere. But the Bible nowhere uses the language that we are born sinners. Now we're going to look at a couple texts here in a few minutes. That people might think that. But the author who is telling us uh, this is bringing the best text that he can find in an attempt to support his theory. And so um, we're going to spend most of our time on Ephesians, and then we'll come to a couple of the other texts very, just very briefly. The author seems to assume that Ephesians 2, verse 3, clinches his point. Now, let me, he, says he's, uh, he says he's reading from the NIV, so I'm going to use the NIV translation here. Actually, the NIV is actually a pretty good Bible uh, in most of its translation. But here is the translation of Ephesians 2, verse 3 in the NIV. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Now look at this sentence here. You can turn to Ephesians 2, 3. Like the rest, we were, no, it says, we were by nature deserving of wrath. That's how they translate it there. We were, like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. Paul helps us to understand Paul because he wrote uh, nearly half the New Testament. So I, what I've done here is I've outlined Ephesians 2 and how do we understand scriptures? What do we do? What's the basic Protestant approach? Do we get on the phone and call the Pope? Do we get on the phone and call our theologians? We let scripture interpret scripture. Now, what's the best way to let Scripture interpret Scripture? Well, we're going to look at the author, and like if it's in Paul, we'll look at Paul's writings. And what's the best thing to start with? Well, if Paul says something here, let's say he writes this letter, and he says something here, but if he says something similar to it here in the same letter, we should look at that too, shouldn't we? What about if Paul wrote this letter, and Paul wrote this letter, and there's some very great similarities between the two letters. Would it be helpful to compare what he says in this letter with this letter? Yes. This is the basic Protestant approach, comparing Scripture with Scripture. I know it's not very popular anymore, but when's the last time that stopped me? <laughs> or you? <laughs> so we're going to try to do some of this here. So um, I want you to notice some business going on here. Let's just look at Ephesians 2, and if you have the page open in front of you. I'm just roughly, not, not in detail, but roughly outlining what's going on in Ephesians 2. So it starts off in verse 1, you were dead, you were dead in your trespasses and sins. By the way, whose sins were you dead in is the people that Paul's talking to. Were they dead in Adam's sin? They were dead in their own trespasses and sins, right? See, I don't need Adam's sins to become guilty because let me tell you, with my own sins, I'm plentifully guilty. And I need salvation. And with your sins, you're guilty. You don't need Adam's sin to become guilty. You have become guilty. At some point, you became a rebel. You did what you knew you shouldn't do. And the angels wrote it down. And you need salvation through Jesus. So you were dead in your trespasses and sins. When did you walk in them? This is interesting. When you look at the book of Ephesians, 
There are more time or temporal references in chapter 2 than in anywhere else in the book of Ephesians. Maybe in anywhere else in the writings of Paul. Now, now, these are not all formal references to time, but in some of it in the Greek is very definite. Some is, some is more in the English apparent. But so let's we'll look here as we go. You were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you, when did you walk that way? In which you formerly walked, this is the NASB translation. So you used to walk in these sins. According to the prince of the power of the air or the spirit that is, oh, here's sort of a time frame. Where is, when is this spirit working? He's now working in who? In the sons of disobedience. I want you to notice also that there's parallels here. Paul uses these two phrases back and forth. Sons of disobedience and children of wrath, those go together. Those are, those are in common. Verse 3 is the, the key verse here. The, you are uh, now working in sons of disobedience, among whom we formerly lived. We used to live among those people in the lust of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature, phusis, by nature, children of wrath, even as the rest. Now that is taken to say, well, look, you're by nature child, a child of wrath. You, you are born condemned. You're born guilty. You have original sin. That's, that's the theory. Well, what, let's keep reading. Let's not stop. Verse 4, but God, even when we were dead in our transgressions, whose transgressions again are those? Our transgressions, not somebody else's. These are actual things we've done. God made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved, raised us up with him, seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the ages to come he might show the surpassing riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God, oh, look at this, a time reference, God, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. Formerly, you were at that time separate, and I skipped a few verses up here to save time, but now you're brought near, formerly you were far off, but now you're not strangers anymore, God is growing, he's building the, the thing, and we're being built together into a temple in the Lord. Now, this is Ephesians 2, sort of shortcut version of it, to get it all on the page. Uh, but just looking at the context of it here, do you notice anything interesting? There's a way you used to live. There's a way you live now. But does this say that anybody was ever born guilty, born condemned? It says, by nature, children of wrath, that's the translation they're putting on it. But let's compare this with some more stuff from Paul. Now, it turns out that if you flip a few pages to Ephesians 5, verses 6, 7, 8, and 9, you get a parallel. So you're still in the book of Ephesians, same author. Verse 6 in Ephesians 5, because of these things, which are listed in verses 3 to 5, you might turn there because we're going to look at those in a minute. Because of these certain things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. That's the parallel with the children of wrath. And then he says what? Do not be partakers with them. You were formerly darkness, but now you are light. In the Lord, walk as children of light. So you used to live this way. Now you're supposed to live this way. You're, you were in, you were darkness. It doesn't say, by the way, you were in darkness. You were darkness. You had sinned. You were in the rebel faction against God. Now you're children of light. Now you're in Christ. Now live this way. And so he's telling us what we used to be when we needed salvation and what we are now. You know, we've all heard the saying, it's not a Bible verse, but isn't it true? I'm not, I thank God I'm not what I once was. And I'm not what I'm going to be yet. But I know that when, if I let God finish the work he's begun in me, he will do it. So, you know, we're, we're in process of drawing closer to God. Now, it's interesting if you go over to a different book. Uh, by the way, there's just so many parallels here between chapter 2. But, uh, in fact, while we're here, we should look back. Look at Ephesians 5 now. Go back to those first verses. Because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Go over to Ephesians 5, verses um, verses 3 to 5. And let's see what those things are. And let's see if those things are things that happen 
uh, before you're born, or if those are things that happen uh, when we choose to sin. So verse five, verse three, I'm gonna just read it out here. But immorality or any impurity of, or greed must not even be named among you as is proper among saints, that's verse three. Verse four, there must be no filthiness and silly talk, no coarse jesting, which are not fitting, but rather the giving of thanks. Verse five, for this you know with certainty that no immoral or impure person or covetous man who is an idolater has an inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you with these empty words, for because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Question, how many of those things in verses three, four, and five can you do in the womb? Filthy talk, coarse jesting, idolatry. Are the little babies in the womb bowing down to idols? Impurity? Are the little babies in the womb greedy? They might be hungry. They might sound greedy, but they just need milk, right? They just need. So uh, these are things that are particular, distinct sins that you do after you have some brain going on, after you kind of have grown a little bit, and you know that you can steal the cookie from your sister. You know that when mom's not looking, you might be able to grab it and get that thing down before she catches you. Okay, that's, that's, that's a greedy thing. But right here we're told that God's wrath comes upon who? The sons of disobedience. Why? Because of these kind of actual sins. Not, it says that God's wrath comes upon them because they were born with red hair or born being human. Look at Colossians chapter 1. If you go to Colossians, many, there's many parallels between Ephesians and Colossians. We don't have time to look at them today, but uh, there is an interesting parallel at these first few verses. Here it is. So Colossians 1, and Paul seems to be touching some of the same stuff. Look at this. Verse 20, having made peace, although you were formerly alienated and hostile in mind, you were engaged in evil deeds. Yet now, verse 22, he has reconciled you by the way, notice verse 23, if indeed you continue in the faith. How are you reconciled? Well, you're reconciled if you stay in the faith. In other words, God's not going to force anybody to stay. Let me give you seven quick business, quick items here on this. Um, number one, there are time references more and less formal all over the place here in Ephesians. There are more time references in chapter two of Ephesians than anywhere else in Ephesians. Number two, Paul uses very similar parallel expressions, sons of disobedience and children of wrath. Number three, I want you to notice this. Paul is careful when he discusses actual sins to attribute ownership. He talks about your trespasses, your sins, your, our transgressions, and so on. Paul is assigning you your sin. Number four, in all cases where Paul refers to what the believer was formerly, he contrasts it with what they are now through Christ. See, and our hope is in what we are now through Christ. Number five, in Ephesians 5, 6, we just talked about all that. Paul says it because of the things listed in Ephesians 5, 3 to 5. God's wrath comes upon them. What things are listed, we just went through the list. He never says that God's wrath comes upon them because of the nature they're born in. God is not a respecter of persons. It's like all the red-haired people are saved and all the brunettes are lost. That's not the way it works. Number six. If Ephesians 2.10, remember we have that up here? Where is it? There it is. If God prepared our good works beforehand, then why are we condemned beforehand for being born into, an unda into a damaged nature which we didn't choose? Find me some logic there. See, God gives every person opportunity to choose whom they will serve. Joshua said, as for me and my family house, we will serve the Lord. God is letting us all choose. And finally, number seven, if we are born tainted or slash condemned or slash guilty of sins that we haven't chosen, and if, an infant, if infant baptism practiced by Catholics and some Protestants solves that problem, then why has the Seventh-day Adventist church never practice the baptism of infants. But if this article is telling us the right thing, then should we go Catholic and begin baptizing infants? 
By the way, if you read the preeminent Greek lexicon of all time, I've got this at home, it's BDAG. It's like this big and that thick. Uh, if you read that, it suggests no less than four distinct meanings for this word, phusis, that's in 2.3. Uh, uh, but we won't plow any further into that for now. Friends, what is happening in Ephesians 2, just to boil it down, Paul is saying that through Jesus, we who have sinned, and that's, by the way, all humans that attain moral accountability, we who willing, we will willingly receive it have been given the gift of eternal life. That's a pretty good thing. Rather than saying that sin is a state into which humans are born, the inspired writer says that we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Gentiles were formerly, this is all Ephesians 2, Gentiles were formerly far off, but have been brought near by the blood of Christ. What does he do? He reconciles willing humans to each other and to the Father, and he is in the process of building us by his Holy Spirit. Friends, he is a good God. So let's our t or turn our attention to the idea that Jesus is unique in comparison to us. That holy thing, or the holy one. Now, by the way, let's not go too far here. Let's stay in the Bible, because friends, it is true. Jesus is unique compared to us. He is unique. He is God. We are not. And there are other ways he is unique to us. For example, because he is God, he has the right to divine power. It may be interesting for us to ponder for one moment just a few lines from Ellen White's book, The Desire of Ages. There's a chapter in that book titled, As a Child. Do you remember that chapter? It's an interesting little chapter. And that chapter touches the childhood of Jesus as well as the human childhood in general. I want you to hear this, two quotes, here from page 69, Desire of Ages, as they, and in this reference she's referring to children in general, as they received the principles of the law into the heart, what does she say? The image of God was traced on mind and soul. So as you as a child received the principles of the law of God into your heart, and maybe you had a parent or a godly grandparent who was teaching you uh, from the Bible, praying for you, uh, mothering you or fathering you, and as they taught you God's things, you are receiving the principles of the law into the heart. The image of God is being traced on your soul. That's what we all want to have. We didn't all, did not all have it as a child. That's one thing she says, and she's talking in general about children. Now let's see what she says specific about Jesus. This is page 71. While he, and this is referring to Jesus, while he, Jesus, was a child, he thought and spoke as a child, but no trace of sin marred the image of God within him. She goes on to say he was not exempt from temptation. It was necessary for him to be constantly on guard in order to preserve his purity. He was subject to all the conflicts which we have to meet, that he might be an example to us in childhood, youth, and manhood. Friends, Jesus is your example. He's your example in manhood or womanhood. He's your example in youth. And the Bible doesn't say a lot about the childhood of Jesus, but the Bible tells us, she's telling us here, that Jesus is our example in childhood. So Jesus is the pattern for all children and all youth, but not if he was exempt, as the Catholics teach, or he experienced the human frailty that we experience only vicariously. There was a person who was a pastor, he was a teacher, he was a conference president, he taught at the seminary, he was a general conference staff worker, he was very widely known, he wrote 13 or 14 books years ago, not just a random person. His name was M.L. Andreasen, and he addressed these points many years ago, and I'm quoting, the present conflict within the denomination is not one of semantics, as some have insisted. It is a question of our denominational existence. That's what he said in 1960 over some of these same, same business. It's a question of our existence? That's a pretty big claim to make. Andreessen wasn't guessing, though, about these things. Now, in this, in this letter, he quoted Ellen White from the Youth Instructor, July 20, 1899. Let me share that with you. So he wasn't just making this stuff up. This is Ellen White again. Unless there is a possibility of yielding, temptation is not temptation. Do you think that's true? Unless you, you, you might yield, it's not even really a temptation. 
Unless there is a possibility of yielding, temptation is not temptation. Temptation is resisted when a man is powerfully influenced to do a wrong action. And knowing that he can do it, resists by faith with a firm hold upon divine power. This was the ordeal through which Christ passed. What? What ordeal did Christ pass through? It's right on the page. Temptation is resisted when a man is what? Powerfully influenced to do a wrong action. I'm telling you that our Lord Jesus was truly tempted. He was powerfully influenced to do a wrong action, but he didn't do it. Hallelujah. Knowing that he can do it, he resists by faith with a firm hold upon divine power. This was the ordeal through which Christ passed. He could not have been tempted in all points as man is tempted had there been no possibility of failing. He was a free agent placed on probation as was Adam and as is every man. So there you have it. One. One slip. He loses his probation. Adrian quoted this. And then he quoted from Desire of Ages, page 49. This may sound familiar to you. It would have been an almost infinite humiliation for the Son of God to take man's nature even when Adam stood in his innocence in Eden. But Jesus accepted humanity when the race had been weakened by 4,000 years of sin. Like every child of Adam, he accepted the results of the working of the great law of heredity. Also, by the way, page 71 of Desire of Ages, Christ says this, Christ was not exempt from temptation. Look it up on page 71. Christ was not exempt from temptation. In fact, Andreessen continued and he said this, he was not exempt from pain or passions or pollution or sin or death. He was not exempt from any of these. He met them and conquered them. And on page, that's page five of his letter. On page six, he wrote this. I don't have slides, these last two. If God favored his son, he would in that act have admitted that man cannot keep the law, that it was necessary for God to exempt Christ from some of the requirements he had imposed upon man. That would be for God to admit defeat. And I agree with Andreasen. Finally, on page six, he also said this, that Christ did not possess either passions or pollutions is clear, for he was the son of God, perfect, pure, and holy. That God miraculously exempted him as he did not exempt the rest of humanity, that he favored Christ so that he could not sin, is heathenism of the worst kind. Yes, Andreessen was known for clear expressions. But he found some who were unwilling to hear his warnings and helps. Well, let's talk about some of these specific bits here. We won't spend a lot of time with these because these are all relatively easy. The Ephesians one hasn't been addressed too often. But one of the references we had here was in Luke 135. Just take a few more minutes here with this and we'll be done. This isn't really a big problem here. What did Luke mean, though, at Luke 135, where the King James, James Version says that the baby Jesus was what? That holy thing. This really doesn't raise any problem for you and I as believers because Jesus was Mary's what? His second kid? Jesus was Mary's firstborn son. Luke himself explains it in 2.23 in the same book. Go over one chapter in Luke to Luke 2.23 because he says that every male who opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord. Where is Luke getting this? Well, perhaps down there in Numbers 3, uh, 11 to 13. This is what the Torah says. Again, the Lord spoke to Moses saying, Now behold, I have taken the Levites from among the sons of Israel instead of every firstborn, the first issue of the womb among the sons of Israel. So the Levites shall be mine. For what does he say? For all the firstborn are mine. On the day that I struck down all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, I sanctified to myself all the firstborn of Israel. From man to beast, they shall be mine. I am the Lord. So the firstborn child is holy. That's Numbers. That's Luke. That's... That's Bible. Now, Jesus, uh, remember this also, Jesus never chose to sin. He certainly was holy to the Lord. Jesus was God's preeminent one. The firstborn of the Hebrews in Passover, the Levites after the firstborn in those things were types pointing to Jesus. So if they were holy and they were types pointing, 
Then in, and he, Jesus says that the firstborn are mine, I sanctify them to myself. Then Jesus is the great antitype. Jesus was holy indeed. So this isn't really any kind of a problem in Luke 135. Jesus was the firstborn child, and he certainly was holy. But was he different from other babies in, in so many respects that, you know, other babies are born condemned, but Jesus was somehow exempted? No. Friend, no baby was ever born condemned. And no baby ever will be. We have still Psalm 51.5. Bible writers are inspired by the Holy Spirit, and what do they do? They write consistently with themselves. Turn to Psalm 51. How could David mean in Psalm 51, verse 5, that he was born condemnable for his human nature? So if you're in Psalm 51, you'll see verse 5. He says, I was shapen in iniquity and sin my mother conceived me, or some variation on that, depending on your translation. How could, how could David say that in verse 5 and go to verse 7 and say, and ask God to make him clean. In fact, in verse 7, he says, he's praying to God, make me clean, not only randomly clean, make me clean in terms of like whiter than snow. That would be pretty clean. How about verse 9? How could he ask God in 51.9 to blot out all of his iniquities? If because of the humanity he was born into, it was impossible to remove this theoretical original sin, how could David say, blot out all my sins, blot out all my iniquities? How could he say it in the same psalm? What I'm telling you is that many people have misinterpreted this psalm to support a dogma that's an unbiblical dogma. What if David, however, was expressing himself superlatively, as is often found in Hebrew, and he meant that he was conceived in a world damaged by sin? and he was born with drastic liabilities, or even that he was perhaps conceived in an immoral sexual liaison by his mother. That would also fit Psalm 51.5. Those meanings would fit there without spilling the wine of Babylon's unbiblical doctrine of original sin onto the pages of Scripture. We don't need to do that. The, the, the common interpretation is not the necessary interpretation. And we want an interpretation that is... In, that is consistent with the Bible. Well, one more thing here. Is the whole person corrupted by sin? In the article, this author wrote this. Not only a part of a human has sinned, but the whole person. Therefore, everything is affected and corrupted by sin. Question, is that true? Well, let's look at something. And you, you surely have this book on your shelf. It's a little bit called Steps to Christ. Steps to Christ, page 47 and 48. What you need to understand is the true force of the will. This is the governing power in the nature of man, the power of decision or of choice. Everything depends on the right action of the will. The, now watch this sentence. The power of choice God has given to men, it is theirs to exercise. Keep your thumb on that line. You cannot change your heart. You cannot of yourself give to God its affections, but you can choose to serve him. You can give him your will. He will then work in you to will and to do according to his good pleasure. Thus your whole nature will be brought under the control of the spirit of Christ. Your affections will be centered upon him. Your thoughts will be in harmony with him. Through the right exercise of the will, an entire change may be made in your life. Friends, it may be satisfactory to say that everything in humanity has been affected by sin, but here it is absolutely clear that however affected the human will is, it is not so corrupted that man is helpless. Rather, to fallen men, these thoughts say, the power of choice God has given to men, it is theirs to exercise. Are we affected by sin and, and by, by the impacts of these things? I'm pretty sure we are. But God is stronger. We heard it just before the service started. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And I happen to believe it. Turn to uh, Hebrews 2. If a man is born a sinner, but Jesus is not born a sinner, then Jesus is no longer, longer even our model. And guess what? Then no human person has overcome sin in our fallen humanity or even showed us how it can be done. We're, we're without any of that. 
if Jesus did not come in our kind of humanity. This idea, by the way, also turns the sanctuary teaching into an embarrassing accessory. Because after all, when the sanctuary has been cleansed and humans stand before God without a mediator for forgiveness of sin, our birth humanity is unchanged. We are still condemned in our being and we cannot live without sinning in that time. If that's, if that's the way it is, then guess what? Then God's power is insufficient for us. And then the door of probation, when that slams shut, we will all be lost. And yet the goals of this article, the article, author of this article, like the one to which I refer, almost certainly is not to make the church more like Rome in doctrine. More likely, the author, well-meaning but misguided, is simply concerned and desires that Adventists forget such quaint teachings as any close of probation or any cleansing of the sanctuary in heaven that entails actual cleansing of the hearts of his people on earth. Probably that's what's really going on. We can only read his article. We can't read his mind. But friends, well-meaning men and women are sometimes caught up in dogmas, and they do not realize it. We asked the question at the beginning. I guess I better give you the answer. I do not believe that Protestants should go Catholic. Replacing Jesus with an exempt divine being or with a vicarious actor who all untemptable reads his lines and hits his marks from a distant heavenly perfection. I don't believe we should trade in our Jesus for that. And as I close, I return to the problem the theory published in that article poses. If all humans are born in some way condemned, Can Jesus be human and be born condemned? He cannot. Any such teaching requires Jesus to have a humanity substantially different than our own. It removes our sinless and sympathetic Savior and replaces him with an exempt, vicarious, and hollow God. My plea is that we keep Jesus of Nazareth. The Bible is clear, and I'm going to close with Hebrews 2, 9 to 18. Some good news here, finishing out. Hebrews 2, verses 9 to 18. But we do see him who was made for a little while lower than the angels, namely Jesus, because of the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. For it was fitting for him for whom are all things and through whom are all things in bringing many sons to glory to perfect the author of their salvation through sufferings. For both he who sanctifies and those who are sanctified are all from one father, for which reason he is not ashamed to call them brethren, saying, I will proclaim your name to my brethren. In the midst of the congregation, I will sing your praise. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, Behold, I and the children whom God has given me. Therefore, since the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise also partook of the same, that through death he might render powerless him who had the power of death, that is the devil, and might free those who through fear of death were subject to slavery all their lives. For assuredly he does not give help to angels, but he gives help to the descendant of Abraham, Therefore he had to be made like his brethren in all things, so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the things pertaining to God, to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For since he himself was tempted in that which he has suffered, he is able to come to the aid of those who are tempted. And I'm going to keep that Jesus. Protestants should not go Catholic.